Hello and welcome to another live version of the Latest Shiny Podcast. We are recording another session uh, from the Key Bank Emerging Tech Summit in Vail. This is an annual event where um, Key Bank brings together emerging uh, leaders in a whole bunch of different technology areas, and we just geek out on everything. Uh, this year, Edge has been a big topic, which is exciting to me, um, in addition to all the normal things you'd expect. Here with Val Perkovici, who is going to talk to us a little bit about Edge. We've been having some great conversations and blockchain. He was actually the inspiration for a post we did at IBM Think, uh, where we, we sort of talked about whether blockchain had a place in the mm -hmm. data center, which was really exciting. So that's great homework if you want to go back and review that material. Val, give us a little intro. Thanks, Rob. And by the way, I really want to second that post because I love the skeptic's <laughs> view of any particular technology. Really well written, and I think, you know, adds credibility, if nothing else, to the real blockchain use cases. I'm happy to keep playing the skeptic <laughs> for you. Who am I? Uh, Val Berkovici, longtime database, longtime storage guy. I'm most recently CTO of NetApp SolidFire, helping starting four years ago, I guess, now with the integration of that very large acquisition by NetApp of uh, the Boulder-based SolidFire company. About two years ago, left. I was curious around uh, what the AI industry was about. Didn't really have a lot of hands-on experience. Got that with a startup I was recruited, recruited into called Paratus.ai. They're still around. Uh, they target the data center vendor markets, the vendors that Ooh. sell into okay. data centers, such as all the infrastructure vendors we know, enterprise software, enterprise hardware, to a certain extent cloud vendors. And they target the more advanced level three, level four automated tech support. Okay. So you'd have virtual assistants today. Paratus provides a virtual expert to complement virtual assistants and be able to go deeper and deeper. We're hearing RPA vendors say today, which is go deeper into the, you know, augmenting the human in the loop process. Customer support, as we know, is one. This is a new one to me, but for a big deal in, in, at the conference is robotic business process. RPA. Or, or, RPA. Robotic process automation. automation. Yeah. Robotic process yeah. automation. So check it out. It's really interesting as a topic. Very, very interesting. You have to find a guest. As a tangent, you know, I always thought, actually, and I, I kind of confirmed that as well when I was at uh, Paratus AI for uh, about six months, the AI industry will not likely have a big breakout company that's an AI company succeed. A lot of acu hiring going on right now. Uh, quite a lot of it, as a matter of fact. However, this category of RPA is a practical application of AI, of machine learning, in a very horizontal context. And so companies in this space, there's one where a lot of friends of mine are going called UiPath. They have a chance of being breakout companies. I know that one in particular already has unicorn billion dollar valuation. Uh, they're definitely growing fast, hiring again. As I said, a lot of friends I know that are very entrepreneurial. So that's one to watch. But let's, let's talk about me. So uh, <laughs> my latest startup, uh, confirmation bias being what it was in my prior machine learning startup is that there's a lot of data challenges and therefore business opportunities and supporting data scientists and data science and machine learning. I formed, uh, I got two really great co-founders together. That's the secret to, I think, a good startup, or at least beginning one is these higher co-founders that are better Shout than you. Shout out to co-founders, <laughs> that's true. So uh, Kumar Palyapanan is my CTO, our CTO. And Kumar's fantastic. He's got a, a deep analytics and um, in real-time advertising data pipeline background expertise. More importantly, he comes as a package package deal with a team of experienced developers that have been with him for a while. And Scott Sanchez, you know, an OpenStack veteran, uh, multiple, well. multiple exits on the go-to-market side. One of the amazing things about Scott is that he instantly added value on the product side because he did the smart thing that, you know, engineers don't think to do, which is engineers, when they prospect, you know, for early product market fit, talk to customers and ask the question of, if we had feature X, would you buy? Or if we had feature Y, would you buy? Scott said, you know, when would you buy, not would you buy? And that really formed a minimum viable product, as he likes to call it, minimum interesting product. And that's what we did, even though we had the concept roughly a year ago. Uh, we had some really feature-rich alpha releases. Uh, it was the beta program that we started in Q2 of this year, around March, you know, mid to late March, that had the MVP out there. We had really fantastic or unexpected, I would say, feedback from our beta customers. We had a couple of well-defined use cases in mind, but as we started, you know, mining our own networks and our own Rolodexes, so to speak, we got access to more and more interested beta customers, and they were from all sorts of verticals. So before we get into the beta, the beta launch, because I, I know you want to talk about that, I want you to stop for a second, and because this is a blockchain application, and you, you've managed to go the introduction yeah. without saying blockchain. Yeah. 
I, I'm not going to ask you why blockchain. Every everybody is it's doing a startup with blockchain is like printing yeah. money. So I'm not going to go there. What is what do you use blockchain for? It's a couple of things you said that are fascinating. One is you know why did I wait so long to m- mention the B word yeah. blockchain? We learned early on in the fundraising process that blockchain is very polarizing for investors. So we learned in investor discussions not to lead with it. but <laughs> Polarizing for everybody, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is. It's true. But particularly for that first audience we paid a lot of attention to, investors. Secondly, you know, the, the whole ICO thing um, is not something I believe in. And it, clearly it's something that has you know gone through the, the hype cycle, peaked really fast. We're definitely diving down, I think, we, as we're recording today, the... The crypto market is crashing pretty hard, so it's 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 going down into the trough. I'm holding, I'm holding <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, and so the bottom line is, blockchain is core to our value, but it's not the end of the value chain. It's an enabler. Well, I, I, to, to me, what you're saying very clearly is, don't confuse cryptocurrencies and ICOs and and that with the actual tech of doing useful things with distributed ledger, particularly in enterprise. And I like the way you would use that last word, distributed ledger. So Bloomberg just uh, published an article last week quoting both Forrester, Senior Forrester, and, and Gardner analysts in blockchain, saying that the, the pace of enterprise blockchain adoption in 2018 has kind of ground to a halt. And there were big aspirations wow. at the beginning of the year. Okay. And the, we see that firsthand, you know, back to the beta program, we see that firsthand in that there's an overwhelming amount of complexity to absorb, you know, if you're an enterprise, you know, user or maintainer of a blockchain. Just things off the top of my head, there's entirely new academic disciplines that no one's figured out, such mm-hmm. as decentralized autonomous governance. You know, governing is hard. You know, look at the headlines lately. Governing is Actually, hard. Actually, all three of those words, to, <laughs> each one of those words is hard. Together, yeah. it's a Venn diagram that makes me a little sad. So yeah. toss in token economics, brand new academic discipline, very okay. young discipline, young science, if you want to call it that, young field of study. Uh, no one's a real expert in it, but you have to be to operate a successful blockchain. I was an expert in token economics in the 80s when I was playing video games. <laughs> there you Not go. Not the same thing. You okay. know what? That's a practical application you know, in, mm-hmm. into this new field uh, in a blockchain world. You've got the challenge of recruiting miners that could be mining other coins to your blockchain. <laughs> Back to the 80s, miners. Okay. Then you've got... No, no, totally different miners. Got it. <laughs> Minor I'm going to stop the joke track and just focus on the podcast. Sorry. Then you've got the challenge of retaining those miners if you recruited them. Uh, One of my favorite new websites is crypto51.app.app. That's a new domain that gives you the real-time cost of brute force attacking any blockchain out there and effectively taking it over and destroying its, its, its immutability, its validity. So there's so many challenges towards actually... You know, running your own blockchain and then doing a token offering and ICO uh, on it. I actually heard that Ethereum was changing their consensus algorithm uh-huh. to get above 51% just in case somebody uh, compromised 51% of the nodes, which is terrifying yeah. to me that somebody might actually compromise Ethereum with that many nodes to have, have to capture that many nodes. There's, an, still there's, worried. A, there's a real-time ROI, which actually has gone lower today because of the cost, obviously, of Ethereum is at least the U.S. dollar cost of it has gone lower. So bottom line is it's really a complex technology. It's overwhelming for enterprises today, which are used to simple packaging of solutions. Okay. It's overwhelming for an enterprise to consider it. The visual I have in my mind is Dennis Rodman wearing a pot coin shirt on CNN in <laughs> Singapore talking about the Trump Kim Summit. That's my visual for what enterprises think of blockchain today. <laughs> that so, is a, the perfect visual. Yes. It is. So a lot for the risk averse enterprises, which are the majority, lots of reasons to just pause and, and their, you know their 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 pot coin is going up in smoke. <laughs> I understand. So having said that, you ended one of your last questions with the word ledger, which is really what we focus on. Right. And I, I want to post, from a homework perspective, we did a, a, a really good podcast, another live one at Glucon with uh, Blockchain Technology Partners. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that has some great background and some other tech in it that I think Val and I are going to skip over a little bit. So if you want to hear more about how blockchain works, we did a really good job sort of di- diving into edge use cases there also. I highly recommend that podcast. So, so at Pencil Data, what we realized is Literally, less is more. We decided not to do a traditional crypto-based blockchain or any any proprietary blockchain at all because we didn't do an ICO. We realized that if we focus on non-payment use cases, mm-hmm. that's actually the vast majority of enterprise workflows that we could okay. add value to. Not Nobody a, gets nervous. Right? right. Not with a blockchain, with an abstraction layer to two real blockchains under the covers, but the interface is a simple distributed ledger. It's the S3 of blockchain. Okay. And we realize in just dramatically simplifying the interface, we've got it down to three restful verbs. Register something, data, code, an event around it, a configuration, what have you. And then somewhere in that continuum of buyers and, and, and suppliers, 
have someone else or yourself validate it later on. Okay. Those are the two main verbs you need to integrate into your existing workflows and add this decentralized trust that, that so, is is desired. All right, so I want to make sure I'm understanding. Cause are you describing a blockchain service or are, are you actually acting on the blockchain itself and then distributing it? We are describing a value which is the ability to verify anything digital. Okay. And there's a really good security, you know, not analogy, but a really good security alignment in all of the modern zero trust approaches to security. So zero trust always verify around identity, around endpoint access, around internal network traffic. Right. It may be suspicious. We now do the exact same thing, but for things at rest, for okay. data at rest, for code at rest. Again, for events around data and code at rest, we basically that let you not presume that your data hasn't been tampered with. Uh, because it's a very dangerous assumption today. So this is, and I, I have to say, this is one of those places where we see blockchain and distributed ledger emerging as a a useful zero trust solution, mm -hmm. right? Where where we're saying, look, and edge infrastructures, there's no perimeter, you can't trust anybody, but you have to interact yeah, with them. Yeah. And so what you're you're saying, you found some applications for needing a, a zero trust environment that's you know not all edge. I'm, I'm in, I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm leading you a little bit. I'm you are, and, and, and I love this use case. Like, I'm a car guy, so this is where we're going here. Is um, Even though data scientists were our sort of original use case, this beta program that we had you know, throughout most of uh, Q2 and Q3 opened our eyes to the variety of use cases, the most fun one so far. And I don't want to bias against the other ones we're working on, but um, <laughs> the most fun one so far is autonomous vehicles, okay. specifically autonomous taxi services. And so what we found is that just, you know, the vehicle part itself of an autonomous taxi service is not one piece of software. It's 150 different software suppliers. that used to be Grease Monkey part suppliers okay. that now have firmware and entire operating systems that come to bear. And you have to have, you know, a certainty around the emergency patch cadence of each one of those 150 different code bases. Yeah, these are actively developed software environments, right? With 150 moving... Targets exactly. Wow. Okay. There is no centralized authority structure that satisfies. Right. Did that. my radar get pat with the latest security patch or not? Okay. Unfortunately, we saw what happened in Arizona. You know, is my sensor setting correct? Is my sensitivity correct? It was so in Arizona, Arizona, there was a there was a, a, a fatality involving a pedestrian where a self driving car didn't correctly navigate. The algorithm worked exactly as expe expected. The sensor worked exactly as expected. The configuration setting for the sensitivity of the sensor was wrong. It was a, a manual human error oh, setting. Oh, DevOps, my autonomous <laughs> car. Oh, dear. Yeah, the bottom that's... line is the autonomous vehicle space, whether it's you know driverless taxis, drones, delivery vehicles, all sorts of other use cases we can imagine. Uh, very much an edge IoT, you know, advanced edge IoT use case. Mm -hmm. I predict you know IoT might have been a tired or, or fatigued buzzword, but the autonomous vehicle space will add renewed vigor to it. It'll, it'll really change our lives within five to ten years. That's become a really hot, you know, hot, hot bed of activity for us. So what you're describing here in the distributed ledger case is being able to create a snapshot view of all of the, the, the basically the software state of the vehicle. Correct. So that when somebody actually has a chain of trust about what, yeah. what their experience was. So if they're getting into a car that has, has or has not yeah. been patched, somebody can somewhere say, ah, you got into the car with the wrong rev software. It's not too bad for the driver, but at least there's a, there's a chain where you could actually say yeah. this is what happened. So certainly the, the driverless vehicle service cares about that. The manufacturer cares about that. We as passengers care about that. The people who have the most money on the line are the insurance companies. Okay. So for liability purposes, they're mandating now that, yes, before any new passenger gets into a driverless taxi, you've got to certify, or as we do it, fingerprint the state of those 150 software components, of all the LiDAR telemetry, the sensor state, the GPS coordinates as well as GPS data to make sure that, because there is no driver, in case something happens between origin and destination, that the car can either safely stop or can work around an accident or weather-related issues that you know, close roads. So lots of complex state to make sure that is deterministic, that if and when an investigation has to happen, you know, right away on site, the police investigators have access to authentic data where the camera frames are fingerprinted, the LIDAR telemetry is fingerprinted. I, there's, there's a part of me that's a little sad that the forensics are driving this use case, but I, I also appreciate the fact that this is a real need. Mm -hmm. The fact that insurance, you know, just because the insurance companies are asking for it doesn't make it a bad thing. It's actually oh, no, really this is, important. This is a good thing. It's very important for us to be able to say, look, 
we can we can verify every piece of, of the infrastructure that we're about to put our lives in, in front of. That's that's exactly the right, right way to think of it. Our cool. lives are at stake here. Uh, you know, fatalities will occur, or failure scenario, failure mm-hmm. modes will occur. But the fact that we'll be investigating, you know, known, good, verified data around those failures, and not just failing fast, but learning fast, is a good thing for everyone. Right. Yeah, the go fast and break things does yeah. not apply for <laughs> autonomous cars. Yeah, we, we all know what happens yeah, there. We, we don't want to experience that. So that's really one of our, you know, funner, if that's a word here, okay. use cases that we, we enjoy working on. But if you just take a sidestep there in terms of the exact same workflows and apply it to medical devices, MRI machines, CAT scan machines, these are like multi-million dollar machines. And it's the same workflow where they have many, many software suppliers that make up an MRI machine. And insurance companies as well, you know, maybe it's a different department or different companies right. or different brands, but fundamentally, for liability purposes, they need to make sure the state of the machine is correct. There are no zero-day vulnerabilities. So, so wait, I want to put on my blockchain skeptic hat for a second. Why does that have to be a distributed ledger? How, you know, why isn't that just a, you know, collect all this, hash it, and yeah. send it up to a server in the sky? I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, the, the most dangerous single point of failure in any organization that has a digital workflow, you know, what call it IT, call it any other organization, OT, is the admin. You know, the admin can be bribed. The okay. admin can be coerced and blackmailed. The admin can be part of an organized crime scheme to profit, you know, from tampering with state, with data. Oops, I lost the, the hash. Okay. So with centralized authorities, you know, if, if it's the admin that's ensuring that the, the medical device, you know, the MRI machine is current and up to date, and that you know the images haven't been tampered with, and then there's effectively a single point of failure in a chain of custody. Okay, so let me let me back up because what you're saying is all the vendors that are participating in the car, the MRI machine, whatever, they all have a vested interest in in their state being the true state that they've reported, mm-hmm. and they don't want to be on the hook mm-hmm. for somebody tampering with the, with it and saying, oh, the sensor was actually not at this rev, even exactly. though it was, yeah. and so they everybody has this vested interest in not relying on a central yeah. authority because individually they all have a lot at stake. Okay. And when one supplier or one part of this you know, chain of, 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 of value in, in the workflow has an incentive to basically, you know, if they fail, has an incentive to sort of say it wasn't me you know, because they're not the ones that get penalized, they're not the ones that get their insurance rates affected, they're not the ones that loses the next contract for the deal and so forth. Right. There's incentive there to tamper with the evidence, to tamper with the digital fingerprints. So this is uh, this is fascinating because, I mean, a lot of the distributed ledger cases that we see are where it's a composited product mm-hmm. or a decomposited, like a, with, with a fruit shipment or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. But, but we're, re- what we're really talking about is a chain of custody question. Very much so. So I've always thought, like with the, the I deliver strawberries from the field scenario, it's like, why don't I just have a centralized database? Yeah, yeah. But if there was an E. coli outbreak, exactly. right, it would, somebody might be very incented to fudge that record to make it point yeah. to not the refrigeration that failed, but, you know... The, the, so the legal vertical is very active, was very active in our beta program. And okay. the legal you know, vertical taught us a lot. Our, our customers taught us a lot that today, if you want to present digital evidence in court, like here's this PDF file or here's this you know, screenshot of an email saying that someone did something bad you know, right. in, in black and white, uh, you can actually bring up a technical expert on the stand that can shoot through the, the veracity, the authenticity of that if the chain of custody was just through a centralized authority that can be coerced, can be bribed. Because you have the authorization as an admin, as a sysadmin, as a DBA, to change records or files as well as the audit, tra- audit trails for them. Right. You know, regular audit trails or audit logs. So a it's, decentralized approach. It's still a bizarre podcast because right <laughs> so far, lawyers and insurance agents are the heroes here in, in, in you know, driving us to good IT practices. But I'll, I'll accept it. That's just the, the diversity of you know the application of this kind of technology. Well, well, I think I think this comes back to veracity and truth. Yeah. And so you know we're we're sort of used to modern IT systems, you know, source of truth, mm-hmm. big database, centralized yeah, yeah. authority. The reality is, you know, and we use clearing houses when we need trust. And what mm-hmm. we're saying is, well, we don't need that no. right now. This is really a distributed trust exactly. environment. Exactly. Okay. So there's a lot of efficiency towards not having a clearing house. And as we've seen with organized crime now and the Im- incredible imagination of hackers nowadays and the social engineering, the tools that they use, you know, clearing houses are not as trustworthy as they once were. And centralized authorities, unfortunately, are not, not as trusted as they w- once were. And a decentralized trust model uh, is actually never foolproof, nothing is, 
but it's much more trustworthy in this day and age. Okay, so I want to. You, you had said something else that I want to bring in, because you've been talking about four different types of data security. Yeah. So da- this data of big data. You mean. Of big data, yeah, right? Yeah. And so in that, in that, you're you're attacking a, an unusual leg of the four types. The one that really hasn't been addressed at, at scale yet by a lot of vendors. The, okay. the fourth one. So we we know volume. We know variety, and so we know velocity. That's sexy to have fast system, analytic systems. Veracity, you know, which is providence, you know, lineage, authenticity of, of data, of digital content of any kind. There's, there hasn't been a lot of activity in that space, and we've gotten but, we've gotten pretty far with just assuming that the data we have is up data's to date. in the lake. It's all clean exactly, water. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Okay. And then, you know, I think when you and I first got into this business, one of the first things we learned was garbage in, garbage out. Fair and enough. that hasn't changed over the let's say years, not decades. Yeah, but I always so. thought of garbage as just bad, you know, unclean. Like yeah. it's data that hasn't been processed, or it's not. Yeah. You, you, I mean, you're you're really talking about trust, not just trust. Active attacks on data. So there's okay. a term that I'm going to talk about later in my lightning talk here called data poisoning. Okay. Uh, as we know, all these knowledge models, particularly neural networks, are trained, you know, by data. And there's incentives in competitive environments to have your knowledge model, your neural network, perform better than someone else's, your competitors. And I have, I have friends with personal anecdotes of doing very traditional things, image classification. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, this is actually a, an app that looks at, you take photos. If you want to cook something, you take photos of the ingredients you have on hand on your counter in your fridge. Sure. It recommends it recommends a recipe and it has videos that you walk you step by step for how to prepare that. You know, the founder that I, that I talked to has a security background. Is what, what he notices, notice that his, basically, you know, the, the fit rate or, or the success rate in which that his algorithms identified the ingredients was decreasing over time. Okay. And it wasn't just normal data drift, which is data scientists call. He noticed that, you know, his data set was being attacked as it continuously updated, you know, the, the model's confidence level and fit. And, and he suspected people were essentially trying to make his app just less productive, less successful. You know, for various reasons, they could have been academic, they could have been commercial, they could have been state sponsored. Who knows? Wait. But, so, but, but how does how so how does blockchain improve the veracity in that case? Is, I mean, somebody's actually adding fake information. This this requires a you know it's a bit of a transitive or tra- you know transitive kind of uh, relationship here. There's a very big trend in AI and machine learning today called explainability, explainable sure, AI. Right. The actual science of looking at a model in isolation, looking at a multi-layer neural network and explaining how it works isn't there yet. You can't do that today. Right. So all you have are the digital breadcrumbs. And so the supporting term behind explainable AI is data reproducibility. Okay. To get data reproducibility, not only do you have to have access to all the data sets that you used in the past, you have to prove that they are the same as they were at the time. Point, exact point in time they train the model okay. at that version of the model. Right. And so that's what we do in that case. We fingerprint the versions of the data as the models are being trained so that when you have to go back and answer the question that a regulator or a customer asks, you know, why did the algorithm do that? Why was my insurance claim denied or approved? Why did you know the car swerve or why did it not recognize a stop sign? You have the ability now to definitively say, well, here's how it was trained and here's why these new layers in the neural network did this. Well, I mean, I could easily see the applications for the models themselves mm-hmm. because, you know, veracity of models, and we've been talking yeah. about this with, in a whole bunch of different forms over the last two days. Veracity of models is a life or death thing. Um, and in, there's in a lot of commercial use case, and, there's, is, and, yeah. and there's a lot of commercial value, right? Yeah, it's yeah. easy to underestimate. We did, we did a, um, in a Conda session, we talked about uh, layers of models and things yeah, like yeah. that. That's another good podcast to review for machine learning. And and there's a commercial market for trained models. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, and, then, yeah. and then you're going to want to be able to have a, a chain of trust mm-hmm. that the model you're building on top mm-hmm. of is the model. It, it still strikes me as a, as a big step to be able to take all the data in the model and then trace back its points of origin. Mm-hmm. It's necessary, though. You know, Pete Warden, who is one of the, the developers and, and I think also PM on TensorFlow at Google, okay. uh, publishes a great blog, Warden, uh, W-A-R-D-E-N. And he wrote one uh, very seminal blog a number of months ago called The Data Reproducibility Crisis, which talks about the reality that data scientists are not engineers. The way at which they acquire data and use it to fit their models and you know, reach the right confidence levels and so forth is haphazard. Okay. And then, you know, when they actually promote the models into production and the questions get asked on explainability, they struggle to reproduce the data uh, and explain the behavior of the model. And so 
tools like you know version control systems for your data, as well as you know veracity or authenticity of the of those versions are really essential towards being able to run AI in production. Wow. Okay, that's a big. It, it's it really makes you you think through, you know, from a from a distributed ledger blockchain mm-hmm. perspective, you know, what we're talking about is truly distributed information. Yeah. That has multiple versions, multiple sources. Correct. That you can't just throw them all in a centralized catalog and expect the right things to happen. Yeah, it's okay. it's, a, it's an assumption, and we know how dangerous assumptions can be in this day and age. Yeah, it, I mean, it strikes me that that's that should be easy and safe, but I could easily see if, if you know, you, you, there's no way to track it. All. It's the same assumption as you know, I've got a great firewall. Why do I have a security problem? Right? There's just oh boy. So so so, it, so, so ways, you're saying is, is the centralized data. ledger is my yeah. perimeter? It is, and I actually want to want to get internal security. So I, I yeah. I'm I'm using multi-layered security. Okay, you can put it that way. So the east-west security is actually you know saying, all right, I can I can this one each piece of data I actually have to track for. Yeah. Right, so are you able to talk about your, your Salesforce use cases or is uh, that? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, not a, the timing is phenomenal because just yesterday, after two to three months worth of certification effort, to appear on a Salesforce app exchange, you've got to go through a business review as a, as a vendor on the, on the marketplace. You've got to go through a legal review, a technical review, and the most interesting one, of course, is a security audit. And that's the most time-consuming one. And so we went back and forth. They found some security gaps in our first version. And uh, we were able to fix them quickly and iterate. And then uh, just yesterday, I believe, they approved. You know, they approved their app. We passed the final security audit. They approved their app to appear in the marketplace. So we're going live now on the Salesforce app exchange quite a few weeks ahead of when we originally planned, okay. which is good because now we can begin to convert our beta customers. We can begin to, you know, tap into the, the, the early leads that we have and be able to announce not just the launch of the service and the offering, at Dreamforce, but do it with reference customers. And, and so we're going to drop be dropping this this podcast yeah. right around that. So I, I want to give you a chance. You know, we're sort of in the back half, but I want to give you a chance to explain it. I, I want to point out before I do that, right? When it comes to valuable data, Salesforce is like the king yeah. of valuable data. Yeah. Um, and so being able to add value into that is is a big deal. So House Pencil Data helping Salesforce provide more value. We go to market in two ways. Okay. We, being engineers, needed to build a platform that provides the simple distributed ledger interface, okay. provides the abstraction layer to one or more blockchains, real blockchains on the back end. Okay. You know, uh, whether it's private, such as the two flavors of Hyperledger, Fabric and Sawtooth, mm. or one of the public ones, starting with Ethereum. We wanted to make sure that even though we simplified the problem for enterprises, we didn't sacrifice anything on the actual distributed you know, or decentralized trust value of, of the da- things that are being registered and things that are being verified down the value chain. So that at a platform layer got implemented. And all those fun use cases I talked about are platform level okay. API driven use cases. That requires you know developer engage- engagement programs, that requires business development. So we of course wanted to accelerate our path to predictable revenue versus lumpy revenue. Sure. And we decided to eat our own dog food, consume our own platform API and release turnkey solutions. And we did the same sort of stack ranking analysis and said, if we could pick the first one, the ideal first one, what would it be? Salesforce. Makes sense. That's how we got here. So what we're providing at Salesforce and what we're exposing on the App Exchange is the SaaS turnkey solution that hides the, the platform API it's built upon. Okay. We don't expose yet the platform API directly. Oh, so this Salesforce. is so. So there's a pencil data platform. Yeah. But there's also a SaaS version that makes it easier to consume yeah. within the platform. Yeah. So so basically, Salesforce data can go through. A distributed ledger process. You can verify. Yeah, yeah. You can create a chain of trust yeah. against your Salesforce data. Absolutely. And so we, we're just ruthless about simplicity, especially okay. our first version. We wanted to make sure there was as minimal friction as possible to adopting our technology, essentially adopting blockchain for trust. And what we did was we just released a SaaS plugin for Salesforce admins. Good news is there's two hundred thousand of them. Right. Many of them are going to be at the show, and what they're able to do is essentially opt their organization in. To fingerprinting every file the users in their organization upload into okay. Salesforce. That's an automatic registration, and then they're able subsequently, whenever you know a legal situation comes up, a split discussion for distributed global sales teams, a channel registration dispute. Okay. Whenever any one of those things comes up, you have a timestamp. More importantly, you have a fingerprint for the data that's irrefutable for the file. In this case, it's irrefutable. So what you're saying is, from a legal perspective, time it. Salesforce's own internal time stamping is questionable. 
or no, it's, that, not that, that it's questionable. It's okay. just that when it comes to an escalates into an arbitration matter or a legal matter, okay. which commission discussions often do in the commission, they're so large. It's like a sideways verification. So yeah, you get a double, exactly. you, you can it's actually a double say verification, it's and you can prove in a legal context that it wasn't a centralized authority that maintained that chain of custody, was a more trustworthy decentralized authority that can't be easily compromised. Wow. Okay. So in in a case where right, I'm I'm dealing with data that's yeah. potentially very valuable, yeah. high commissions. Um, you know, anything where there might be some questionality of, of when something happened, that it happened, that somebody yeah, didn't yeah, upload, exactly. you, know, you can't fix it behind the scenes. No, no. As an admin, you know, in a, what's fascinating is a couple of things. Is A, there's a lot of um, use cases that aren't directly security related or even business related. Uh, Salesforce had to disclose just the other week that there was a bug their marketing cloud team introduced into their marketing cloud service in June. The disclosure happened in late July. And it was around the fact that, unfortunately, the way a particular RESTful API was updated, some data leaked, shouldn't have leaked outside of the domain, outside of Salesforce itself, okay. and some data was overwritten. And in the wow. Salesforce disclosure, they couldn't identify exactly which customer was affected. They had an idea of which customers were, but not exactly this which ones. This one, is one drop of bad data corrupts the whole, Correct. all the data. And okay. moreover, even within the customers where they did identify were impacted by this bug, they couldn't identify exactly which files. Wow. So, so that one bug mm -hmm. could any court case that relied yeah, on exactly. Salesforce data yeah, yeah. could it immediately becomes compromised. Absolutely. So, Reasonable doubt instantly. Right. And so, yeah, this is a huge thing, and and that's not a unique to Salesforce no. thing. Everybody's going to have. Exactly. Oh, oops! My I had the wrong foreign key, and I wiped out. You just have to show that it happened. Yeah. And every record in the database yeah. is is considered. And in this Suspect. case, the value is multifold. One well, it doesn't is, mean throw out your databases. It just no, means no. that if you're going to be in a court of law, know what you, you, might want, you <laughs> might want a second, a second source of truth. And so uh, in, in the Salesforce sort of you know, reputation and loyalty case for their customers, now Salesforce can use this technology to say, we definitively know which customers were affected without question, and we know which files within every customer were affected without question. Wow. So it's a benefit to Salesforce themselves, which is not something we directly intended, it, but... It's also, of course, a benefit to those customers to have certainty as to whether they were affected and certainty as to which files to go and recover. And so so how, how much overhead are we adding in doing this? Very little overhead. This is a very lightweight process. The idea is we don't store data. It's bad to store data on a blockchain to begin so with. So this isn't like a Bitcoin where it's uh, hundreds of miners and every transaction no. creates this huge no. echo of, of CPU load throughout, no. the, throughout the universe. There's a great sort of geek tangent we can go into here, which is that... Uh, most of the ways blockchains are practical at any level of scale is a scaling solution. And the most popular category of scaling solutions are off-chain scaling solutions. Okay. So the Lightning Network is one of the more famous ones in the Bitcoin. Now, Ethereum has several scaling projects. Many of them are off-scale, uh, off-chain scaling solutions that are okay. underway right now. We do the same thing. You know, We, we have non-payment, non-sort of crypto functionality. We don't need to worry about replay attacks. Therefore, we're able to implement a very straightforward off-chain scaling solution, which is a database in okay. front of the blockchain. And a database can have instant response time in terms of registering things and, and verifying things, but we maintain complete internal chain of custody through to the underlying blockchains that the okay. admins choose to use. And in fact, the platform level API gives you the option of which blockchain or set of blockchains to use. The turnkey SaaS solution on top does not. By default, it goes to a safe one, which is Ethereum, it's public. Okay. Uh, most enterprise customers, and we say, let's give you know, give us a connection string so we can connect to your private blockchain. They say, oh, we're not ready yet. We want to, but we're not ready yet. So Ethereum is a good default choice in terms of a public blockchain. Okay. It's reputable enough, it's stable enough, trustworthy enough, with precedence in court. Uh, and so that's the backing technology behind all the registrations and validations that we offer in turnkey solutions like the Salesforce one. So is, is there a cost to inv involving Ethereum in your blockchain Absolutely. solutions? There, there's okay. a gas cost, literally. Okay. And uh, the CryptoKitties use cases, it was you know very well known. It was a popular game um, that kind of choked the network a few months ago. Okay. Um, it was literally like a, a Tamagotchi thing, a collectibles thing, but done you know um, on the blockchain so that you could track you know, essentially the value of okay, these things sure. as you roomed them and traded them and sold them and so forth. Um, so long story short, taught us that there's a lot of volatility over and above the speculation on the price, a lot of volatility to the cost of transactions on what's called a mainnet, the public Ethereum blockchain, because of the variable activity, the, the, the traffic on the, on the, the network, so to speak. 
Cool. And so what we do, of course, as part of our off-chain scaling solution is pick optimal times to actually go ahead and commit all the batched up you know, transactions in a database that have chain of custody that we basically use the platform API to hash continuously and maintain. Right. There's an optimal time to actually commit that and, and add that as a block on the blockchain in terms of performance and cost. And so once it's committed, then it's created the record. So okay. it, 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 what we call sort of really persists the immutability of that chain of custody that we started, you know, with the database acknowledgement. Okay. So, so there's, there's for scaling purposes, you batch yeah. things. So yeah. there's some, there's some time delays, but it's, there is. Yeah. And, and for we're the talking turnkey, about court of law type of thing. For it's, the turnkey it's, solution, you know, the feedback has been, you know, if it ends up on a blockchain and there's full chain of custody, it's provable. That's perfectly adequate for us because we'd rather minimize our costs. We'd rather maximize you know, our performance and, and minimal so, latency. But, but this is really interesting. So essentially you're going into the public square, you're shouting out the data that you, you're saying, you know, listen here, yeah. I've, I've, I've done this work. Yeah. If somebody somewhere it gets yeah. noted down yeah. and it becomes part of the public record, yeah. that's, that's part of the secret in this distributed trust is you have to distribute it so yeah. that, so that the trust is there. And yes. once it's, once it's in that, that blockchain, it, you're sort of, but doesn't that, does that generate a cost? Like, does somebody yeah. somewhere pay for the Ethereum? Compa- you know, you're, you're actually adding we, overhead to Ethereum. We basically right? bundle it into the simple subscription cost we charge okay. our Salesforce customers in this case. So there's a free tier, up to 100 files. There's a small, medium, and large tier that follows that. The increments are 10,000, 100,000, and a million files. Okay. And, the, and the subscription costs monthly are respectively 100, 400, and 1,000 dollars a month. Okay. And we always like to say, you know, if you're basically actively managing more than a million files at any given time, give us a call. If you'd like to know what you're doing, you know, we might have a better solution for you. Gotcha. Yeah. At that point, maybe your private blockchain. Exactly. Chain yeah. yeah. But that's, so this is a really fascinating thing. And, and you know, we haven't had a discussion that sort of tied these pieces together. Mm-hmm. The need for a public blockchain mm-hmm. that you can participate in to create that public trust is a factor for this. So if you could imagine certifying firmware through a blockchain absolutely the ethereum you know putting it on the ethereum yeah. blockchain means that that everybody would have access to it and if you needed to certify oh yes my bios is the current version Correct. or this model is the current version you can go out to a public source and and verify yeah. oh this looked really good um so the use case is an iot we spend most of our time on the industrial iot side right. but the consumer commercial iot sector you know think of all the nanny cams that have been compromised and mm-hmm. so forth giant opportunity there perfect partnership opportunity for one of the partners in that space to consume our API and simply and easily you know, deliver that certainty to their customers. Wow. All right. So I'm going to, I need to wrap up because we've been going a long time. I feel like we're, we're just getting to some really cool technical meat <laughs> as always. There's always another podcast. And there's always another podcast. Um, so, so Val, um, we're going to be dropping this right around uh, Dreamforce. Yeah. How do people find you there? How do people find you in general? We will be in the exhibit area in that startup alley, you know, with, with dozens of other startups. Uh, so you'll have, I don't have a booth number for it yet, but we'll be there. You can obviously look us up uh, on the web at PencilData.com. We have a Twitter handle with an underscore, and there's a long story behind that, which we'll get into it on some other podcasts. Uh, we're on LinkedIn as Pencil Data. We actually are, are, are exercising a little bit of, of bias and not being too active on Facebook intentionally. But we're not hard to find. I'm Val Bercovici. You can, you can Google me uh, all day long. Uh, my email is valb at penciledata.com. So please do reach out. We'll, we'll, we'd love to talk to you about really any question you have about what we talked about. Val, this has been fantastic. I feel a lot smarter about blockchain. Hopefully, uh, listeners too, let us know if you want to hear more about blockchain. Um, it is an interest area of mine, personally, to, to do blockchain in the mm-hmm. edge. And Val and I are going to probably have more oh, yeah. discussions about it. And we'll bring in some other industry experts. So. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And not brown nosing here, but you are really just a great statement here. You're asking the, the right <laughs> probing questions. I think the important questions is because it is a, a complex topic with a lot of speculation and hype. And it's good to cut through as much of that as possible and get know, to the reality of notice it. Notice Val likes the questions, not the humor. So <laughs> noted, noted. Thank you. My pleasure, Rob.